Hi everybody, my name is Joe Buggy and I'm a genealogist with Ancestry. I work with our Pro Genealogist Division, which is our division of in-house professional genealogists. I am the lead for the Irish research team and I'm based in Ancestry's office in Dublin in Ireland. And today I'm going to take some time to chat a little bit about some of my recommended collections on Ancestry when doing Irish family history research. So when I'm using Ancestry for my family history research, I always start from the card catalogue. The card catalogue is the list of all collections on the Ancestry website. So how you find that is as follows. If you go to search and in that particular drop down, then you see a large grouping then of the different types of records that are on the Ancestry website. So if you move down to the bottom, you can see here the second last option then is card catalogue. So if you click on that then, it brings you to the list of all the collections of records then that are on the Ancestry website. So you can see in this particular example then, it is displaying Canadian records only. So the first record collection then that I want to talk about from Ireland is the Catholic Parish Registers. The Catholic Parish Registers is one of the most important collections to consult when researching in Ireland. At a high level overview then, the Catholic parish registers are the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. They contain baptism, marriage, confirmation and burial records. The collections that we have on the Ancestry website span a wide variety of decades and centuries, starting in the late 1700s and moving all the way through to the early 20th century. Now the standout collection in particular is this one here, Ireland Catholic Parish Registers 1665 to 1915. We can see here that there are almost 26 million records in this particular collection. But I just want to highlight that we have some other Catholic records on the Ancestry website. Um, and what's great about these particular records is the fact that they are full color copies. And it is not, this is something that's not available then elsewhere. So typically we can see when it comes to coverage for the Catholic parish registers, and especially in this main collection here, starting in the late 1600s and working its way then through to the early 20th century, and there's a general rule of thumb in terms of coverage of these records. The more urban the area in Ireland and the more uh, English speaking as opposed to Irish speaking, we can find that these records will start earlier. And typically we can see then that the further east in the country we are, as opposed to uh, in the western counties, we can generally also see that these records will start earlier then as well. So there are many important reasons why we should use this particular collection. Firstly, um, the civil registration of government birth, marriage and death records didn't begin in Ireland for everybody on the island of Ireland until 1864. So for important life events before this date, we're very much reliant for Catholics on the uh, Catholic parish records. And secondly then, when civil registration was widely introduced in 1864, it took probably well into the 1880s before there was widespread compliance then with the, the law to record birth, marriages and deaths. Alternatively, we see that the vast majority of the population was Catholic and it was very important for them then to have all of their children baptized and to have their marriages uh, ceremonies conducted in a Roman Catholic church. So we see almost near complete coverage then when it comes to important life events then being recorded. The types of information you will get then, and in particular, the key collections were, or the key records we're looking at in this particular collection are baptism registers and marriage registers. So for the baptism registers, you'll get the name of the child, you'll get the date of the event. Sometimes you get the date of birth then as well, and you'll get the names of the parents, you'll get the sponsor's names, you'll know the name of the parish because that's the, the parish that you're researching in. Uh, and sometimes you will get specific addresses then within that particular parish, which can be obviously be incredibly useful. The marriage registers then, again, information can vary quite widely. You might just get the names of the marrying parties and then the witnesses to that particular marriage. But again, it could go further. You could get more detailed information, such as exact addresses as to where the bride and groom then are from as well. So I wanted to share some tips and tricks when it comes to using the uh, Roman Catholic parish registers on Ancestry. So something that's very important to do is to use what are called wildcards when searching in collections. So a wildcard is a, a method of searching where a symbol, which is typically an asterisk, is used as a substitute for one or more than one letters uh, in a family name. So I was recently doing some research for client who had ancestors 
uh, butlers in County Kilkenny. So my I'm from County Kilkenny and I have a good understanding of parish registers from that particular area. And I knew that from these particular registers, because of the priest's handwriting, um, you would often see that the crossbar and the T um, carried over onto the L. So it looked like they were written B-U-T-T-E-R, uh, butter, but in fact it was B-U-T-L-E-R. And the wild cards are very important to use in genealogical research in general, but particularly when we look at parish registers, because on the island of Ireland, there's about a thousand parishes. Uh, they span a wide variety of time period. So therefore, you would have hundreds and, and in some cases, low thousands of numbers of priests who would have worked in these parishes uh, over the, the time period. So you get a wide variety of uh, handwriting. You get some good handwriting. You'll get some terrible handwriting. You'll also get faded pages then as well in the registers. So this is where wild cards can come in very useful because it will help you to find your surnames, uh, the ones that you're interested in, among those maybe that might be poorly written or it might be faded. So you can see the examples that I have here then. Uh, I have used B-U-T asterisk E-R in my search, and I've just picked an example from 1864 in Kilkenny, but you can see how some of these then were indexed. You have Thomas B-U-T-T-E-R, you have Catherine B-U-T-L-E-R, you have Margaret B-U-T-L-E-R, and you have uh, Johanna B-U-T-T-E-R. But as we said earlier, all of these names are butler. They're not butter. It's just the T and the cross power uh, carried over onto the L for the, uh, for the priest's handwriting. So the second tip that I want to give you then actually comes from my own, I'm using the example of one of my own ancestors. So Buggy is a name that's found in County Leash in County Kilkenny. And this is the baptism register entry for my second great grandfather, uh, Michael Buggy. So you can see he was baptized here in 1873. And um, they numbered the register entries chronologically in this baptism register in this particular parish. So he was baptized on the 31st of August, 1873. You can see here Michael. And um, there's a small notation here, Father Shields. So that was obviously the priest in the parish at that particular time. And we can see the parents here, James Buggy and Catherine Lawler. But the main hint that I want to give is it's very important to take note of sponsors' names on the baptism registers. So you shouldn't just glance over these. You should seriously study these names. So in this particular example, we have Michael Buggy and Bridget Buggy. They're the baptismal sponsors. So the reason why baptismal sponsors can be very important is because many times they can be the names of siblings of the parents. So in this particular example, Michael Buggy is actually the brother of James Buggy. And the reason why it's important to study your sponsors is you may have a brick wall on your direct ancestor's line. So I may not know where James Buggy comes from, but studying his siblings, so in this particular example, Michael Buggy, um, that may allow me then to go past that brick wall and find out more information about the previous generation. So anytime you're researching in baptismal records, always make sure to take note of the sponsors. And the same goes for witnesses for marriage records then as well. Those witnesses oftentimes are the siblings of the bride and groom. And the more information that you know about the whole family, um, the more likely you are to be able to kind of find further records about that family and hopefully extend that family then back through the generations. So the second collection then that I'd like to talk about on the Ancestry website that, that's really important and that I use a lot in my research then for my clients is Griffith's Valuation, 1847 to 1864. So Griffith's Valuation is a property and land taxation survey that was carried out then from the 1840s to the 1860s. And the reason why this collection is now so important for Irish family history research is due to the catastrophic loss of census records that we've experienced here in Ireland. If we look at 1861 through 1891 census records, they were all completely destroyed. Uh, there are some surviving fragments for census records from 1821 through 1851, but it really does vary depending on the location. And in some cases, it's very, very few. So when, when we don't have census records, then we need to turn to other collections. An island-wide property taxation survey conducted over an approximate you know, 26, 27 year time period then becomes very, very important. Um, so Griffith's primary evaluation then was conducted by Richard Griffith, hence where the name comes from. And I wanna show you an example then of a couple of different entries to kind of show you the types of information that you can find in this particular collection. So I'm gonna use my own uh, family tree here as an example again. 
My buggies are from County Leash, which is in the Midlands. And this is a sample page then from Griffith's primary valuation. So we can see here, firstly, we get the name of the parish then. So this is the civil parish in, within the county. So the parish is typically known as Timahoe, sometimes known as Fosse. Um, my townland of interest, uh, the townland is the place of origin within that parish um, where my ancestors lived then, is this one here, Coolnabaki. And if we come down here, we can see Michael Buggy then. So Michael Buggy is my third, uh, three times great grandfather. So I'm going to talk through this particular document and the types of information that you're likely to find on it. So the first column here on the left, we have number and letters of reference to map. So there was a series of maps created for this survey as well. So any good property taxation survey is going to have plenty of maps. And there were also maps created then after the survey was completed also. So the number and letter then will help you when you're looking at maps of that particular townland to establish exactly which holding of land is relevant to your particular ancestor. The numbers and the letters then also have meaning as well. So each townland was divided into a series of numbers or plots of land. So we can see Kuhl and Abaki then was divided into um, five different holdings within the townland. And within each holding then, you may have a number of people living um, on, the, on that small piece of land. So we can see here in Kuhl and Abaki, we have on Holding number one, we have James Moffat. On 1A, we have Ellen Drennan. And on 1B, then, we have Michael Buggy. And because A and B, then, are a lowercase, that would indicate that they are kind of lesser tenants or tenants with smaller holdings or land values who live within that particular holding, then, in Kulnabaki. Our second column, then, here is the name of townlands and occupiers. So we've established already the name of the townland is Kulnabaki. And we have the list of all the people then who are occupiers of land holdings within that particular townland. Now, the majority of people typically did live in that townland. However, some may not. Some may have only have been leasing land in that particular townland and may not have resided there. So that's why they're called occupiers more so than residents. The next column then is the name of the immediate lessor. So this is the person that the uh, occupier is leasing their land from. So you can see in my example then, my ancestor, Michael Buggy, is leasing his land from James Moffat. So he's James, the same James Moffat here, who's his neighbor. So he's leasing the land then from his neighbor. The description of the tenement then. So typically we associate the word tenement with poor housing in urban areas. But tenement is just used to, to describe the piece of uh, land or the buildings that the person um, occupies. So we can see here various descriptions. James Moffat has land. Ellen Drennan here has house and garden, and my ancestor, Michael Buggy, has house and garden. Next column then is the content of land. So this is acres, roods, and perches. So my ancestor then had just one rood and 24 perches. And the net annual value of the land, the net annual value of the buildings, and finally then the total net annual value. So that was a, where you would add the value of the land and the value of the buildings together. So that hopefully gives you a, a, a bit of an insight into the types of information then that you can get from Griffith's primary valuation. Um, so just again, some hints and tips in relation to Griffith's primary valuation. So sometimes you will get people with the same name living in the same townland in a particular parish. And the surveyors at the time then were charged with distinguishing between those of the same name in a particular townland. So I wanted to highlight some of those examples and to kind of help you understand about how that extra information can be beneficial for your um, family research. So the uh, surveyors use what are called agnomens. So agnomens were kind of nicknames or further descriptions that were added after the name of the occupier in brackets. So there's many different types of agnomens that the surveyors used. Um, in this particular example, we can see there are three Michael Houlihans all living in Doris East Townland in Fecal in County Clare. So the agnomens that have been used then are the father's name. So this is fantastic information if we're trying to establish the previous generation. So as I said, you may not be able to find this type of information elsewhere, especially maybe in the west of Ireland where the parish registers might not start until possibly 1840s or 1850s. So to be able to find the name of a father then in this particular record collection is fantastic. We can also see then as well that because the typically the head of household was the occupier. Those who were widows were listed in Griffith's primary valuation as well. So these records can be very useful sometimes when tracing female ancestors. 
So here we have in Kilnamac East Townland, which is in County Waterford, we have a Mary Griffin listed here in three lowercase b. And if we come down to holding number 13, we have another Mary Griffin. So the surveyors here, what they've done to distinguish between the two Mary Griffins is to use their maiden name. So we have Mary Griffin, who was previously a Hanrahan before she got married. And coming down here, then we have a Mary Griffin who was previously a Coughlin before she got married. So this is, and again, really, really great information because even though we don't know the name, names of their husbands, what we can do is look for marriages of Mary Hanrahan, if that's your ancestor, to a Griffin, or Mary Coughlin to a Griffin, and then we may be able to find their marriage record, and that can hopefully maybe uh, push us back through the generations. So the third record collection from Ireland that I'd like to take some time to chat about is the Ireland Sustainability Loan Fund, 1812 to 1868. So I, I personally find this a really fascinating collection of records. So basically, in the first half of the 18th century, there was the catastrophic potato famine of the 1840s and 1850s, but there were other uh, examples of localized famines in Ireland, and there was concern around people's ability to provide uh, an occupation for themselves and to provide an income. So a decision was made by ver for various funds to be set up to provide small amounts of capital or small loans to people who they deemed may be able to start small cottage industries. So beginning in the first half of the 19th century, uh, the various loans were given out to people um, in the hope that they could provide an income for themselves and for their family. So what's really great about this particular collection is that most of the funds were administered in the poorest counties in Ireland. And these are the counties that had the highest rates of emigration. So we're talking about County Cork, Limerick, Clare, Galway, Mayo, Sligo. So basically most of the counties or the majority of the counties on the, the western seaboard of Ireland. So you get a lot of great information in this particular collection. You know, people who put themselves forward to get the loan, their neighbors or their family members would typically act as their guarantors. So you begin to get a good understanding of and family relationships and neighborhood relationships then as well. One of the key tips that I want to highlight about this particular collection is that after the catastrophic famine, um, some of the funds were interested in understanding what happened to those who had taken out the loans because unfortunately a lot of these funds did collapse because people just couldn't pay back the money um, because of the famine and so a lot of them went into, into liquidation. But after the famine, as I mentioned then, um, so basically local police constables um, were asked to go out into their local communities to see if they could establish what had happened to some of those who had availed of the funds. What's really, really interesting about this collection is it gives us clues as to what may have happened to the person if they emigrated. So this is a particular example then from Cluny Garivan Townland, which is in County Mayo. So we can see here a James Gohan. And the date of entry then that's provided is the 27th of April, 1846. So if you have been able to establish your ancestors back to a particular townland, and you're kind of wondering maybe when they may have emigrated, we can see here in the notation that he resided there until the 27th of April, 1846, and then went to England in August, 1850. Now, I've seen examples in this particular collection where they talk about people emigrating to Canada, to the United States, to Australia, to many locations around the world. So it is rare enough to find a record in Ireland that talks about um, a person leaving the island of Ireland and where they may have ended up. So as I mentioned already, particularly for those Western seaboard counties, which can be the most difficult sometimes to research in, um, to have these documents and to have records that will give us an indication of where people may have emigrated to then that can be really, really useful um, information. So I hope you enjoyed that um, collection, uh, series of collections that I was discussed. Um, just to recap then again, we talked about the uh, Roman Catholic parish registers. We also talked about Griffith's valuation, the property and land tax taxation survey, and the uh, sustainability loan fund records. So, um, best of luck with your research in uh, Irish records on ancestry and with your family history research in general. So uh, my name is Joe Buggy and thanks very much for tuning in.